We're in the middle of what we're calling the Come Home Sundays. They are just some time to be able to think about the, the renewal of our souls, of what God can do to bring us back to the place where he wants us to be. Not that we've always left home. You can be at home and not be at home, you know what I mean? You can be there, but even not have the heart in the right place. And, and we're looking at the heart conditions in these few weeks here as we're um, taking the idea of coming home. And um, as I was thinking through this, I was thinking of an Old Testament story um, that deals with coming home and having the right kind of heart and attitude. And we're going to look at that today. The background to the story that we're going to look at today, um, we're going to talk about Abraham. And in the passage that we're going to read in the Bible, he still goes by his old name, Abram. But uh, when we read the passage in the Bible, we'll read it as Abram. But to know that God did change his name to Abraham. He had an extra syllable in there. So as I refer to him, I refer to him as Abraham because it's hard to spit out Abram out of my mouth because it's just Abraham um, to me. So we're talking about Abraham. Um, he was a man who lived in the land of Ur, which is modern day Iraq. Um, he was a pagan. He didn't know God, but God just appeared to him and said, hey, I've chosen you to be the father of a nation that's going to belong to me. And of course, you know, out of nowhere, God appears. And so Abraham had the faith to trust God and to believe that that message that God that he received was true. And so he began to leave his land and go to the land that God said, I will lead you to which was the promised land um, of Canaan, and this would be your land that you and your descendants will live in. Well, Abraham and his wife had a problem that they didn't have any children, and they were beyond childbearing age, so it was always a mystery how God was going to keep his word that I'm going to make you a great nation. And from you, there would be a multitude of people, as many as you can count in the stars. So anyway, so he packs up his family, he packs up his flocks, his herds, they travel to the land where they're supposed to be. When they got there, they had some problems because the people living there kind of didn't like them very well or threatened him a little bit. And so they left for a while, went to Egypt, and God said, no, you're not supposed to be in Egypt. Don't be scared. Go back to the land I'm giving to you, and it's going to be okay. So that's the background to where we're at today. So Abraham goes back to the land that God told him to be in. And with him is his nephew, Lot. His name is Lot. And Lot was probably his, his really next of kin. And so probably in Abraham's mind, and he's a, he's a rather, rather old man at this time, he's probably thinking, well, my inheritance is going to go to Lot. He's the one who's with me, and he's the closest of kin that I have. And even though God says I'm going to have children, I don't see that happening. So there was a sense of obligation that Abraham had towards Lot and taking care of him. And they had a very, very good relationship, as we'll see here. So anyway, so we're going to read the passage that we're looking at today. It comes from Genesis chapter 13. We're going to read most of the chapter here. And um, I'll just read it um, out loud and you can follow along. It says, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. To the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great, they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At the time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, 
Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also cannot be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. We have a little family situation. We have a family situation this week at Thanksgiving. We have one sometimes. But it wasn't necessarily a bad situation. Just how do we, de- how do we decide this conflict that we have here? And we are not going to throw Lot under the bus today. Because the New Testament reminds us in 2 Peter 2. We'll look at it later. That Lot was a very righteous man. He was a righteous man before God. He made some decisions that were probably less than wise, but he was a righteous man. And so we're not going to paint him out as the good guy, bad guy sort of thing here. Abraham was good, Lot was bad, but we think we can learn something from the situation that they had. So how did they each choose their home? Here we have two men, an uncle and a nephew. They're both very wealthy. They have returned to the land that belongs to them, and they've each got their herds grazing on the land. And the herdsmen that were taking care of each of these herds, they started arguing with each other. And you can imagine what they were arguing about, right? You know, you've got this herd and that herd, we're trying to keep them separate. You know, you're over there hogging up the water, you're hogging up the good grass, you know. I mean, they just weren't getting along very well right then. But it wasn't just that they had a problem, there were other people living there as well that had their herds going there. And so there was all this conflict going on about... Well, there's all these other people with their herds, and where are we going to find the nourishment that our flocks need? So anyway, that was kind of what the feud was. So Abraham offers a solution. (coughs) Being a very gentleman, very humble person, he says to Lot, okay, the the land is big. Let's Let's just go separate ways, put a little distance between us. That way there's room for all of our flocks. So he offers Lot the first choice. You can go to the right. Or you can go to the left. Whichever way you choose, I'll go the other way, and all will be good between us. Sounds like a good compromise, very gracious compromise. So Lot looked one way and realized, that's not a very good place to graze the sheep over there. There's not as much water, not as much grass. It's kind of deserty a little bit. And he looks over here and he says, wow, there's the Jordan River. There's all the grass, the abundant plains over there. Well, I'm going to take the easy route, and I'll, I'll take this side, Uncle Abraham. So he takes off that way, and Abraham looks over here and goes, Okay, I guess I'll stay over here then. Abraham didn't hold a grudge. He didn't complain. He was, it was important that there was peace between them. But even more than that, Abraham, he trusted God. God led him to this land. And even if God led him to... A place to be able to settle that didn't look ideal. He trusted that God was going to be with him and God was going to provide for him. That's called what? Faith. He had faith in a God that said, I've led you here and this land is the perfect place for you to be. What did Lot do? He made the decision based on what? On what he saw. He saw something that looked like an easy route and said, hey, this makes sense. Why would I go gray sheep over here where there's not too many, there's too much grass growing, where there's not too much water? <clears throat> I mean, he made a pretty obvious, smart choice based on his eyes, what he saw. Did he make his decision based on faith in a God that was going to provide for him? Well, he could have said, oh, well, this is God's provision. He gave me this great place right here. But Abraham... He made his decision based on a faith that he had in God. That even though around him, it didn't look like a great place to be able to live, he knew that God was going to provide for him. A lot of times when we make choices in our lives, and I think this is the application, we make it based on what our eyes see, don't we? We look at a situation, we have to make a decision, and we look at all the circumstances around us, and that's a good thing to do. But if that's the only thing that we base our decisions and our choices on, and not on where is God in the midst of this? I've got all the circumstances here. I've got things I need to make decisions on. Where is God in the middle of it? 
Well, how is God leading me? If we leave that the component out of there and we just look at the facts and we look at the circumstances and our situations, then we're not living by faith. We're making decisions based on sight. And Abraham was a man of great faith. God gave him very little to go on, but he took that little bit and allowed it to grow in his heart where he would just trust God's every word. And so you can imagine Abraham's going over to this land over here and he's saying... Okay, God, it doesn't look real great here. I don't know if there's enough water and grass to sustain the things I have. And it's certainly not as pretty and nice over here. But I'm going to trust you because you said this land is mine. And God comes along and reminds Abraham. He says, look around you. Look to the north. Look to the south. Well, the north, the south, the east, the west. All this land is yours. Even that land that you're letting Lot stay in. It belongs to you. Don't worry. It's yours. And I'm going to be with you. And he says, you're in this desert place. Look at the sand. Okay, I already reminded you that your offspring are going to be as numerous as the stars. But look at all this sand. And your offspring will be like the sand of the desert that's over here. God reminds him, reassures him of the hope that he can have in a God who gave his word. If God said it, he said, I'm going to do it. Even though it doesn't look like it's possible, even though you have no children, even though you're living in this desert land over here, I am with you. And I will fulfill my promises to you. Now, did Abraham enjoy living over there? Probably not. It was a lot more work for the herdsmen to get the sheep where they needed to go and find the water and the resources that were needed. It sure wasn't easy. But he was in the right place, and God did provide for him. We told about some of the things we're thankful for. And sometimes the sacrifice is being thankful for things that were less than ideal in our life. You know, we probably look back over 2018, and there's been some hard times. And some things we've had to go through, or hard times that people around us have gone through. And we wish we could just, you know, snap our finger and make it go away. We don't like to see people around us going through pain and hard times, do we? You know, there's some hard things, but can we be thankful in the midst of those things? Can we be thankful that a God is with us, even when things are tough, even when things are less than ideal and we're in the middle of a desert? You know, there's all kinds of struggles, you know, broken relationships, financial worries, a health limitation, some sort of internal struggle within ourselves that just keeps us in chains. Sometimes we lose our purpose, we sense that our dreams are slipping away, and life hasn't turned out exactly like we hoped it would or planned it would. Maybe it's a loss of someone who can't be replaced, and we feel lonely, we feel stuck. It's a fear or a depression or something that just, we're just in a rut. I mean, there's so many different things that could happen in our lives. But where is God? Where are our eyes of faith? In the midst of those situations. When we get the desert like Abraham, can we have the faith that there's a God who loves us, who's with us, and is going to prosper us, that's going to make sure that we are taken care of. And I don't know where you're at today and what you're dealing with today, but I really feel like that's a message for each one of us, that no matter where we're at, can we keep those eyes of faith Not our eyes that see just the fruit of the plains over here. Eyes of faith that sees God in the middle of our situations. We know things turned out well with Abraham. The way things turned out with Lot was a little bit different here. He settled his tents in the middle of the good plains. And we were told he picked an area that had some pretty evil places in it. There were some cities there that were just full of evil men. And when we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, the first thing that we think of is the characteristic stereotype. It was a city full of, full of, hom- uh, full of homosexuality. That, that wasn't truly the case there. Um, we read throughout the Bible that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were numerous. There was sexual immorality there, but there was also pride, gluttony, laziness. They were ignoring the poor and needy. Um, there was just a lot of pride. It, it was more than, just, more than just sexual immorality. There was a lot of things going on in these evil cities. And you know, God had already destroyed the world with a flood, which he promised never to do again. But these cities were so evil in God's eyes 
that God said, I've got to destroy them. Said, I, they, these, these people just can't go on living the way they're living because they are such, it's, it's just such an abomination the way that they are living their lives. And so, eventually, you know, Lot, he started off living in the tents of the area, ended up moving into those cities. He was there. And God says, I'm going to destroy these cities with fire. And Abraham says, but wait a minute, Lot's over there. He's a righteous man. He's living in the midst of this filth. And we know that he didn't compromise himself because we read in 2 Peter 2.8 that as a righteous man, Lot lived among them day after day and was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. He was living among them, but inside he was so distraught about what was going on around him. Now, it was a bad decision probably to go into there because it ended up having some repercussions on his children and changed their morals and it caused some problems later on. Uh, we know that, uh, that God did rescue Lot and his family from the city in a very you know, dramatic way. And of course, he said, don't look back. And we hear the proverbial Lot's wife who looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. Um, for her disobedience, the faith to just let's leave this and leave it behind fully. And so making the decision for Lot to go to the plains where his sheep would be more taken care of ended up kind of being a, a dramatic, difficult struggle, a trial in his life. And when we are making decisions based on sight and not by faith, it kind of leads us down a road that might end up with some regret later on. Oh my gosh, I'm in this situation. If I would have had the eyes of faith back here to trust God, then I wouldn't have ended up in this situation that was there. Now, I did mention that the city is known for its, for its homosexuality. It wasn't a city full of, uh, full of homosexuals, just to give a, a historical context. In that pagan culture, if there were enemies that you had, one of the best ways to humiliate them was to rape them. And here these angels came into the city to, announcing that God's going to destroy it. So the people of the city are like, we don't like this bad news you're telling us. So they're telling Lot, send them out here. We'll take care of them. So it wasn't a sensual, lustful kind of thing. It was just like, we're going to show them. We're going to rape them and kill them. And so, you know, the... The whole idea of homosexuality in the city is not really what we see today. But just to be able to show that God has mercy upon those who have the faith. And Lot had the faith, but he didn't act on it. He was a righteous man. He knew what was going on around him was wrong. I don't need it anymore anyway. He knew what was going on was wrong. Um, and it tormented his soul. And God rescued him. In the nick of time. And God showed his mercy to Lot and to his family in that great way. So even if we get off and you may find yourself today with your eyes on your circumstances and not on the faith that you have in God, God can bring you back. All it takes is a simple opening up our heart of faith and saying, God, I'm going to get my eyes back on you again. Maybe there's some areas of our life today that we need to get our eyes back on God. I know I can break down my life and say there's some areas I look to God just 100% for and there's others that I'm doing this, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it. And maybe you've got some struggles today. And as we go to the Lord in our communion time today, maybe it's a time to be able to say, yeah, there's some areas where my faith is lacking. God, give me faith. God says if we ask for it, he'll do what? He'll give it. He wants to give faith. He wants to strengthen our faith. And that's what he wants to do even today.